and exploring the local and regional dimensions of stories we do know. So uh, this is what Rick brought me to John Brown. 152 years ago now, with, with one of the most sensational news stories of the century, ripping through parlors, churches, and newspapers nationwide, Connecticut understood that this wasn't just a story. John Brown was one of us. Although the raid on Harper's Ferry failed, the hysteria that followed didn't stop with his execution on December 2nd. It was the talk of the nation and it changed the course of history. Scholars now agree that Brown's plan for a guerrilla-style war of liberation operating out of the Blue Ridge Mountains was improbable, but not proof, as some believe, that he was insane. Had the contagious uprising he hoped for actually taken place, had Brown's provisional army seized um, the 100,000 weapons from the National Armory at Harpers Ferry, and had they mobilized, had they mobilized its manufacturing capacity and then bolted for the hills before the cavalry arrived, as they expected, the Civil War might have begun right then and there. This was 1859. Terrorist or avenging angel. John Brown uh, remains one of the most perplexing and influential figures in American history. Brown was the first abolitionist to cross the line from nonviolence and civil disobedience to armed rebellion. He was the first to plot the forcible overthrow of slavery through an armed uprising, the first to popularize the inevitability of the Civil War, and one of the first truly transracial figures in our history who not only walked the talk of equality, but chose to live among blacks and finally sacrificed his life willingly for their cause. And these are just sort of a medley of, of, connect, of connections of what was going on there. If, if this was a class, we'd turn it into a quiz, but we won't. Upper left is Sinkway. And you, does some of you know who that is? Sure. Association Amistad, thank you. He was the, the uh, 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 captain, the commander, if you will, of the Amistad uh, captives who uh, rebelled. And this is a painting that was painted in New Haven, Connecticut, and they were jailed in New Haven and Hartford. And, uh, this was going on at the time. Upper right is Jonathan Edwards. We'll hear more about him in a moment, of course. Famous because this is the town where he delivered the most famous sermon in the Great Awakening story of uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God, delivered right here at Enfield in 1741. And why that's relevant, we'll get back to. And of course, Connecticut, uh, the guns uh, uh, and armaments and technology uh, on both the left and the right there, and then in the center are those uh, pikes. We'll hear more about those that were used to arm the African-American captives, I mean, not captives, but uh, re rebels that uh, were part of John Brown's <coughs> provisional army. The plot thickens a little. I was amazed, <coughs> excuse me, to discover this, that uh, John Brown's first ancestor in America on, on the Brown family side, <coughs> excuse me, on his father's side was uh, Peter Brown, shown here, and his gravestone is still intact and in, at the uh, Palisado Cemetery in Windsor. That's where the family were fun from. John Brown's third great-grandfather came over on the Mayflower and settled in Windsor in 1658, where their family remained for generations until his grandfather, Captain John Brown, <coughs> excuse me, migrated to West Simsbury and his father to Connecticut's Western Reserve of Ohio. Captain Brown uh, served died serving in the American Revolution. All were staunch, freedom-loving Calvinists. Another connection, uh, is, uh, his father, John Brown's father, Owen <coughs> Brown, and his mother, Ruth Mills Brown, and their four children settled in Norfolk, of Connecticut in 1793, and then moved to Torrington in 1799, where John Brown was born in this house. Owen and Ruth had a convert conversion experience in 1798 after hearing Reverend Jonathan Edwards Jr. preach against the slave trade in neighboring Colebrook. Uh, John, Jonathan Edwards' son was also a minister, had the same name, and he was a Yale graduate, and he wound up uh, having a, a church in Colebrook near uh, uh, Torrington, between Torrington and Norfolk. So his parents are fundamentalists. 
fundamentalist Christians, and they were, you know, real believers, and they took this, uh, the cause of slavery so seriously that they moved to Ohio, which was going to be a new promised land, a place untainted by slavery, and this is uh, part of what their errand in the wilderness was about. Owen operated a tannery, <clears throat> helped found the Western Reserve Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. His home in Ohio, this is John Brown's father again, was a stop on the Underground Railroad. John Brown was raised in an evangelical household, exposed to devout anti-slavery rhetoric, and as a 12-year-old witnessed the beating of a slave boy who was his friend, and it triggered this great sense of injustice. And I always like to point out in these pictures, you know, it's a, the Western Reserve of Ohio was like a, essentially like a suburb of Connecticut, because not only was it partially it owned until 1808, the lands in Ohio were actually part of Connecticut, but the settlers were all from this area. You can see some of the place names, uh, uh, Hudson, uh, Southampton, Talmadge, um, Suffield, uh, and, and some of them, like Granger, Ohio here, was named after Gideon Granger, who was from Suffield. So there are a lot of these little connections, and you can see that, that, that everybody out in that area would have uh, had connections back east, and, and a lot of them knew each other from back east before they, they, they moved here. Uh, this all coincided with what they called the Second Great Awakening, which was in the, basically 1790 to 1820, uh, which was a period, the period of the highest per capita religiosity in the nation's history. In other words, everybody went to church. And those of you who are old enough to remember the 50s and the 60s, when a lot of people went to church, this was more. There, this was like 90% of people converted in regular church attendance. And, and it's interesting that uh, um, uh, the, the ministers in the churches where the family were living, uh, in Norfolk initially, uh, Ami Robbins was the minister there, and, um, and then they had again met this student, uh, son of Jonathan Edwards. Both were students of Jonathan Edwards' protege, uh, Joseph Bellamy, who had an academy in Bethlehem, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, it's interesting that it's a teenager, 16, uh, this was not uncommon. The family's out in Ohio, and Ohio doesn't have, it's still kind of like log cabins and, and not a lot of uh, amenities. And so they decided that they would send John Brown back east to uh, 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 go to an academy, to go get, get a, basically what we would now call a high school education, uh, and, and maybe prepare for the ministry. And um, he uh, returned east and attended uh, 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 Moses Halleck's Academy in Plainfield, Massachusetts, uh, which is um, west of Northampton, and then later attended uh, the Morris Academy in what was known as the South Farms Parish of Litchfield. So, so at 16, he's back in this area. But uh, all throughout his life, I mean, the family had actually lived more opulently when they were in Torrington than they did when they moved out west, because what was there, they're out west, but kind of wilderness. And John Brown, as a result, growing up and living in Ohio in these kind of primitive circumstances, actually developed a taste for that. And I think he always felt that uh, self-denial and uh, uh, luxuries were, you know, self-denial was good, luxuries were bad, and he was a person capable of immense self-discipline and self-sacrifice, uh, which came in handy when he was uh, uh, involved in his crusades, and these are some of the log cabins. We actually, uh, when we were out in Kansas, we photographed some of those. And this is, you know, around here, they, we've got these great colonial houses. You look at the uh, Martha Parsons house, you know, with its George Washington wallpaper from the 1780s. Well, they don't have stuff that old out there. Their idea of the early, early period are these log cabins from the 1850s. So they're, they're kind of a newer history. But, um, and then uh, anti-slavery rhetoric, again, he was exposed to all this. This is a sermon by Jonathan Edwards, Jr. And Leonard Bacon, uh, shown on the right here, was a, 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 a minister in New Haven, excuse me, the center minister in New Haven, who was an evan evangel evangelist who preached against slavery. And you can see that this whole issue of uh, the Underground Railroad and, and the legal ramifications of 
you know, states' rights and slaves as property. All of this stuff was going on at the time, and it shaped the world that John Brown knew. Then, as I mentioned, the story of, of the insurrection of the Africans at, at, on the at ship Amistad. Uh, this was national news, and then in 1831, uh, Nat Turner, one of the most um, widely reported news stories of its decade, was the uh, instance where Nat Turner and a group of slaves on a southern uh, Virginia plantation uh, 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 rose up and actually killed uh, their master and other uh, people who were involved. And this was like terrifying, of course, to the southern uh, plantation culture, the idea that, uh, that they could, uh, that Africans could arm themselves and rise up. So there's all of this tension about slavery and all of these ethical and religious uh, uh, issues that are kind of cross currents that are going on at the time. Well, to give you a little more background on John Brown, before Kansas, which is where he became famous, he actually moved back east from Ohio in 1846. He's already, by this point, decided that he's going to commit his life to fighting slavery. And he moves to Springfield, Massachusetts, where he lives from 1846 until 1852, and he's a wool merchant. And he, he was in a partnership that started in Akron, Ohio, but then he moves east, and they're involved in tanning and the cattle trade, the breed, breeding. Uh, uh, and it's interesting that, that John Brown, when, when you read today about, they talk about fair trade coffee and, and buying certain kinds of foods and goods that have been made by people who aren't being abused. Well, this was kind of what was going on with wool. wool was seen as an alternative to cotton. Cotton was a material that was produced by an economy that the uh, abolitionists, of course, regarded as republic. So John Brown getting involved in the wool trade has a little bit of a political dimension to it. And these are some great things. Documents, this was the a desk that was used in his uh, 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 wool merchant shop in, in Springfield, and they, they've got that up at the Springfield Museum, so those are pretty cool artifacts. While he's in Springfield, John Brown keeps raising the bar in terms of his involvement in anti-slavery. He becomes a parishioner in a predominantly African-American church, the Sanborn Street Church, now known as St. John's Congregational Church, shown in the lower right there in Springfield, Massachusetts. The building that he worshipped in when he was living in Springfield is gone. That's a newer building in the lower right, but the but the church is still intact, and it is still an African-American church. And he, while he was a parishioner, he became, for the first time in his life, in, 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 in a African-American community. There was a significant population of uh, African-Americans, most of them, almost all of them, free blacks, living in Springfield in the 1840s and 50s. And while he's a parishioner, he forms this organization called the League of Gilead, Gileadites in 1850. And they, they, you know, it was kind of a club where they would talk politics a little bit, re re you know, kind of rebellious. And they uh, uh, had this idea that they would uh, adopt Nat Turner's strategy uh, of an armed uprising and retreat from the wilderness. So this is, while he's in Springfield, is when John Brown hatches this plot. And it is also when he's in Springfield that he first meets Frederick Douglass on the upper left there, who was visiting town. So he's, you know, as early as 1850, he's beginning to plot this, uh, uh, hatch this plot, and make connections. And this is the thing that kind of blows my mind. When I was was a curator at Wadsworth Athenaeum, I, I, I never, uh, this thing, came, this picture came up for sale in New York, and I. Uh, we, we never had a photography department, per se, at the Athenaeum, but we had this um, African-American art collection, and, and I was always interested in local things. So when this photograph of John Brown taken in Hartford in 1848 by an African-American photographer, uh, with advertised in the lower right there, came on the market, I thought, boy, this is, this is the kind of artifact you, 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 you just just an extraordinary thing, we should get it. And, and I think my superiors there thought I was nuts, so, because it was just a little photograph, and it wound up selling for 100, 
thousand dollars to uh, the um, uh, National Gallery of Washington, which I felt a little bit vindicated. But really, why I'm not—I should have just mortgaged the house because because uh, <laughs> it's now worth six, seven hundred thousand oh. dollars. So I, I could have, you know, this is like 15 years, 20 years ago, not even. And, and that's a pretty serious uh, markup. It's one of the greatest daguerreotypes ever produced. It's just got everything going for it. And you look at that face. This is 10 years before John Brown becomes front page news for the Harper's Ferry Rebellion. And that's a guy who looks like a man on a mission. And, and a little bit scary there, but that's what he is. He's got his flag. He's pledging the allegiance to something, probably not the United States of America. And it's just an amazing photograph. So. That's, uh, that was taken to Hartford. He'd come down from Springfield. That's probably one many times. He literally passed right through Enfield and, um, it, 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 on his way to Hartford. And then in 1848, um, he travels to Peterborough, New Hampshire to introduce himself to this guy with the big beard there, Garrett Smith, who was a rich Bostonian uh, with, uh, who was passionate about abolitionism and was providing uh, money, fund, funding for uh, these kind of terrorist operations. And, and, and Garrett Smith had this idea that he was going to create a colony, a community of free blacks uh, in the Adirondacks in New York State. And so uh, they, they made a connection there. And it was uh, John Brown at that point decided to move from Springfield to the Adirondacks in New York State, where he would live in this free black community and help it, help it, help it succeed. Of course, binary. <coughs> Great man is a, or strange man, whatever is a kind of a, a struggling woman there. She doesn't look too happy. Neither do the daughters, do they really? But that's Mary Brown. And, and, and this sounds just horrifying when you think of it. Uh, that's Mary Brown with Anne and Sarah. And then upper left is Oliver and Watson Brown, two of his sons. Both of them died uh, fighting for their dad's cause in Harpers Ferry. Um, John Brown fathered 20 children with two wives over the course of 30 years. Nine died in infancy, three more died fighting his wars. He was involved in 20 business ventures in six states. Most failed. He believed in what he call, they call Old Testament just, justice, punished his children and employees. He was apparently humorless, a nonconformist who believed slavery and evil so entrenched it required radical action. He believed that slaveholders and defenders of slavery were wicked and deserved to die. So if you ever have reasons to complain about your husband, how'd you like to have been married to that? Pretty, pretty, pretty difficult guy, I would say, but that's, that's it. That's the wife, and this is the world. Political map of the United States, you really get a sense of how tense all this was. What the whole abolitionist, emancipation, slavery issue was about was geography, political geography. The red states up north, those are the free states. The gray states in the lower uh, and the south are the slave states. And the real issue was driven by the green states, which is all the stuff out west that was up for grabs. And the southern states understood that if the abolitionists and the anti-slave states ever got a majority, that uh, that it would be over for them, that they'd have political problems. So, so that uh, everybody was kind of a, 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 a focused on what's going to happen out west. And that's where Kansas comes into it. Um, there was other things going on in 1837. Um, a Reverend Elijah Lovejoy, shown in the upper right there, was uh, killed uh, by pro-slavery uh, uh, forces. Uh, uh, for publishing an anti-slavery newspaper. In 1837, uh, uh, um, excuse me, um, no, 1856, um, Charles, U.S. Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts was beaten almost to death on the floor of the Congress by a, uh, a colleague in Congress from uh, uh, South Carolina. We think things are, we think partisanship is bad today. They don't, <laughs> Shoot each other, yeah. Um, um, and it, and then it, it, again, this was uh, the point at which um, uh, uh, John Brown committed himself uh, to, as he put it, to consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. So there's all this stuff going on. Um, here's I was recently. This is just another little picture of a place I saw recently. I was out in uh, 
Nebraska. And I found another uh, one of these log cabins that John Brown made, was traveling around the West, uh, spent some time in. But uh, the big thing that kind of got me involved in this was, this, as I said, this trip to Kansas. And um, uh, 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 we, we, it was, it's kind of amazing what the state of Kansas does with the story. They've got trails and brochures and markers and historic sites, and it's really all very interesting and well done. Um, he, he and his, his sons and John Brown moved to Kansas in 1855 and 1856. Uh, um, in May of that year, uh, John Brown had kind of a rough month. On May 8th, his father died, who he adored his father. And on May 21st, the town of Lawrence, Kansas, was attacked by pro-slavery forces. On May 22nd, again, uh, Congressman Preston Brooks of uh, uh, South Carolina almost beat to death Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Congress. Um, and then on May 24th, uh, it was the, the Potawatomi Massacre, which was uh, when John Brown, four of his sons and supporters, hacked to death four, five pro-slavery men to even the score and to cause a restraining fear uh, of uh, the, uh, amongst the pro-slavery forces after six free state men had been murdered in the previous month. So things are beginning to turn violent out in Kansas and John Brown and his sons are involved in that. Connecticut, uh, always kind of in the background on some of this stuff, uh, technology made a difference because John Brown had spent time in Hartford and Springfield, and John Brown was in Springfield, was at just that point that the firearms industry was, at the Springfield Army was really taking off and all this high-tech gadgetry in, in gun making. So John Brown knew all this, and he um, adopted guerrilla tactics and really high-tech weaponry, the Sharps rifles, the AIM swords, the Colt revolvers, and was able, became famous for being able to either stand down or, or defeat forces much larger than his own. So he became a, 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 a famous figure in the Kansas Wars. And as I mentioned, uh, we traveled around and visited uh, some of these sites. We went to the battle of, the site of the Battle of Black Jack, uh, which was June 2nd, 1856. It was the first pitched battle between anti and pro slavery forces. The battle lasted about two hours, involved 90, about 90 men on both sides, and uh, John Brown and his uh, 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 compatriots defeated a superior force at this battle of blackjack. And if you go out to Kansas, this site is as important to them as Bunker Hill is to New Englanders because they, they feel that this is where the the Civil War really started. They they do a, a great job. We went, you know, they've got all these great markers, and you know, it's, I always love historic sites because I think they bring history to life in a way that it rarely happens in classrooms. It's really exciting to go to these places and, and, and learn these stories in them. And uh, then we went to Osawatomi uh, oh, during the summer after the Battle of Blackjack. Uh, two of Brown's, Brown's sons were captured, and the house he'd been living in was burned to the ground. So it's, it's all getting very tense. Then on uh, August 2nd, 1856, uh, John Brown, uh, outnumbered 7 to 1, arranged his 38 men behind natural defenses on a road. Uh, firing from cover, they managed to kill at least 20 pro-slavery forces at the Battle of Osawatomie. And this was really the moment that John Brown became famous because he, he, he showed himself to be uh, courageous and, and, and incredibly skillful at, at uh, commanding troops in, in what eventually became the Civil War. We went to Osawatomie, it was actually interesting, uh, President Obama gave a speech there, some of you know, a few months ago, yeah. uh, and, and it, was, it was, I thought it was a little weird because it was a speech, he went there because Theodore Roosevelt had given a lecture on a topic of great interest to the president a uh, hundred years ago. But the reason Theodore Roosevelt was there is because they were dedicating this park. And, and they didn't, <coughs> Obama or anybody else felt like talking. And John Brown is still, of course, controversial, but, but this is frankly the only reason, well, not the only, the major reason anybody would ever visit uh, Osawatomie. It's a pretty small town. It's much smaller, really, than was probably half the size, maybe a third the size of Enfield, uh, and, and, but they do 
50 to 100,000 tourists a year solely because of this story. They do a lot with it. And we went to the Little Historical Society, which had great things, and then this John Brown Memorial Park. And this is one of the weirdest, I love this, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in the museum business. Uh, this is uh, 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 on the uh, upper right there is the cabin where John Brown spent some time. This is also still in Osawatomie. Uh, the minister in the town, that's his church in the upper left, was married to John Brown's sister. And, and he spent time in that cabin. And you can see that's the inside of the church, that's the outside of the church, and that's the cabin. The reason I don't have a picture of the outside of the cabin is because it's contained inside that stone structure of the lower right. They built a house to surround the cabin. They, they regarded it as such an important historic relic that they actually built a building to house the house, if that makes any sense to you. So you have to go inside that stone building to see a little log cabin that uh, John Brown spent some, some time in. Well, he's now famous because of the Battle of Osawatomie, and he comes back, and he's, he's still got this idea about Harper's Ferry, but he hasn't told anybody, except maybe a few friends, and he meets everybody who's anybody uh, in the anti-slavery movement. Henry David Thoreau, Frederick Douglass, Ralph Waldo Emerson, William Lloyd Garrison, these were all the big, uh, nationally renowned figures of their day. He headed east on a speaking and fundraising trip uh, for 13 months, raising money, going from town to town, telling the stories. And he came to Hartford, and he came, lectured in Springfield, and um, and he just, it was like a frenzy. These people, like, that's Henry David Thoreau on the left, and Ralph Waldo Emerson on the right. They regarded John Brown as a, uh, just an incredible heroic figure. Henry David Thoreau said, uh, uh, who had recently published the book Walden, believed that in Brown he had found the ideal transcendentalist, noting that, quote, there are thousands who are in opinion opposed to slavery and to the war, who yet, in effect, do nothing. Emerson described John Brown as, quote, the rarest of heroes, a pure idealist, a romantic, colorful figure. So he's making the rounds and he meets and all these important people. This is the so-called Secret Six. There have been books written about them, and this is this sort of Boston-based network of rich people who uh, raised money to help uh, arm John Brown's efforts. And they did, apparently, they didn't really ask him what, what he was going to do. They just said, if you need money, we're going to help you. And, and so John Brown is, is raising money for what people weren't sure, but they, they, they trusted him to make trouble. Uh, and they wanted trouble at that point. Uh, he met with Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York. He visited uh, Michigan, and where he met Harriet Tubman, shown in the lower right there. Uh, Frederick Douglass wrote of John Brown. He said, John Brown began the war that ended American slavery and made this free a free republic. His zeal in the cause of freedom was infinitely superior to mine. Mine was the taper light. His was the burning sun. I could live for the slave, John Brown could die for him. So this is the kind of adulation that he received. And while he's on this fundraising tour, he's back in Collinsville, Connecticut, uh, 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 overseeing the commission, he's raising money, and they're, they're making a thousand of these pipes. These are the, 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 the armed, the spears that he was going to arm the African, the slave uprising with. That never happened, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, and, but the pipes were made, they were paid for. And, uh, and they were made in a blacksmith shop in, in uh, Collinsville. And that's a, a park ranger there from Harper's Ferry showing off one of those pipes. And there's one on display right now at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Sam Colt owned it. And uh, they became kind of collector's items after the, the, the war. Uh, and again, all of the weaponry, he's constantly, as he's raising money, he's arming himself. And, and they've got, again, uh, the, the volcanic pistols from Norwich, the Maynard revolver uh, from Chicopee, Colt's revolvers, Sharp's rifles. Uh, uh, he was finding his way around new technology of weaponry uh, he, and became a serious student of the technology of weaponry. Um, there was an ad in the Hartford Current in 1857 that read, for the benefit of those who intend to emigrate to Kansas, we now have in store a good supply of Colt's revolvers, fine single and double barrel guns, hunting knives, etc. 
So people knew that if they were going out there, they better be prepared to defend themselves. While he's in Hartford, the Kellogg brothers that had a, uh, they, they did, they were lithographers, they made pictures, they were competitors with Courier and Ives. He sat for his portrait. And there were people that were devout, anti-slavery people that would, would buy these framed pictures and, and they framed them and they put them on their wall just like you might have a picture of George Washington. He was, uh, at that moment, kind of a hero. So, and uh, John Brown uh, had all these notions, the things that he wanted to do in his life. So he goes back to Kansas. This is after this, uh, many months of fundraising in the East. He goes back to Kansas in 1858. And almost like he's checking off goals on a bucket list, he embarked on an amazing 1,000-mile, 82-day liberation journey with 11 slaves that he stole from, uh, liberated from Missouri. He passed through Nebraska, Iowa, to Chicago, Detroit, and then to Canada, where he arrived in March of 1859. Uh, this allowed Brown to say that um, on top of everything else, he'd actually uh, conducted a run on the Underground Railroad and liberated some of these uh, uh, slaves, and these are uh, works of art that depict that scene. Then, okay, the clock is running out. In uh, 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 August of that year, uh, he moves to Maryland, uh, uh, to this farm, in just very near Harpers Ferry, where he and John Cook and uh, uh, his uh, 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 provisional army uh, prepped for the attack during August and September of 1859. 21 cells, uh, people, in, 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 Plus himself and his daughter Anne uh, were uh, housed in this uh, house here in Maryland uh, where they planned the attack uh, uh, that took place in October of that year. Uh, Frederick Douglass actually visited, visited them there during this planning period. And this is the Provisional Army, Brown's Provisional Army. It included three of his sons, uh, two of whom were killed during the raid on Harpers Ferry. Uh, Aaron Stevens from Norwich, shown on the left here, uh, a Dangerfield Newby in the center there, the one African American who was uh, involved with this provisional army, and then John uh, Cook, uh, uh, again from uh, Haddam. And it was interesting that Colonial, the DAR, which has the Oliver Ellsworth House uh, that I'm sure many of you have been to in Windsor, did an exhibit on the Civil War this past year, and lo and behold, I couldn't believe this, they had a daguerreotype of this Aaron Stevens. Uh, uh, that they borrowed from one of their chapter houses in Norwich. That was something that had never been published or seen, so that was pretty interesting. Well, this was the story. Uh, scenes from Harper's Ferry shown here. The raid took place on October 16th through 18th, 1859. During, during the raid, uh, 10 people were killed, 7 were executed, 5 escaped. On the other side, 8 whites and 1 black were killed, and five wounded. Uh, the, the, uh, the goal of Harpers Ferry, this is, Harpers Ferry was the other place. Springfield was the northern federal armory. Harpers Ferry was the southern federal armory. The reason they were attacking Harpers Ferry was to wipe out the South's capability of manufacturing guns for the impending Civil War and to, and to appropriate those, those firearms. So, and the idea was that they would attack the armory Acquire all this weaponry, and then a local slave uprising would take place, and they'd head for the hills and wage war on America in, from the Shenandoah values. They met no resistance entering town. They cut the telegraph wires and easily captured the armory. They next rounded up hostages from nearby farms. But things then started to go wrong when an eastbound train approached the town. The train's baggage, baggage master, who tried to warn passengers, was the first casualty. Bewilderingly, they allowed the train to complete its journey. It reached Baltimore early that morning after this episode in Harper's Ferry, and then on to Washington, D.C. by late morning. Meanwhile, local farmers, shopkeepers, and militia pinned down the raiders in the armor. At noon, a company of militia seized the bridge, blocking their only escape route. Brown then moved his prisoners and remaining raiders into the engine house, shown there in the lower right. By the morning of October 18th, the engine house was surrounded by a company of U.S. Marines, interestingly led by the then U.S. Colonel Robert E. Lee. Uh, 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 and they approached under a white flag and told the raiders that their lives would be spared if they surrendered. Brown refused, saying, no, 
I prefer to die here. Uh, uh, they gave the signal, and the Marines used sledgehammers and makeshift battering rams to break down the engine room door and capture or kill the Raiders. So this was uh, a kind of a nasty affair, and everybody, John Brown, they were, anyone who survived was taken prisoner, and they were uh, uh, imprisoned in this courthouse in Charlestown, uh, West Virginia. And uh, these are scenes, this again was the biggest news story of the decade, and these are pictures that were contemporaneous showing uh, uh, the uh, 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 scenes from John Brown's cap capture. So this is October, and then he gets the second half of the month and all of November to kind of cool his heels in jail. And in some ways, it was this period of captivity that was John Brown's uh, finest hour. Um, he, uh, this shows him, actually he was wounded, and he appeared in court, they had a trial, Many of the abolitionists in the North thought it was a kangaroo court and that there was a rush to judgment. And it was a Virginia trial, and they quickly condemned him to death. And, you know, unlike here, where if you get condemned to death, it takes about 40 years before they decide to do anything about it, if ever. Uh, in those days, you know, it was like next weekend, you know, you're, you're gone. So that was it. And um, that's John Brown. But uh, while he's in prison, uh, uh, there are all these incredible rallies taking place in the north, and it's just John Brown mania, Harper's Merrick Ferry mania. People were going crazy with the politics of this, and there were, you know, gatherings everywhere. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said he would, uh, that if, if he was executed, he would make the gallows as glorious as the cross. Uh, the Frenchman Victor Hugo called John Brown a liberator and fighter for Christ whose hanging would impart to the Union a creeping fissure. Many were horrified. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne called Brown a blood-stained fanatic. Lincoln called his raid absurd and deplored uh, Brown's violence, bloodshed, and treason. Everybody had an opinion. So, uh, and then this is kind of sad scene. He has a last meal with his wife or a long-suffering wife comes down and there she is, Mary again. And, uh, but uh, he, during the seven weeks between the capture and his execution, he apparently acquitted himself with extraordinary dignity and he was very, you know, he kind of marched to his death with confidence and defiance. And he, in his last words, he published, a lot of his writings were published, he was allowed to correspond with people. He wrote, I deny everything, but a design of free slaves. I believe that to have interfered as I have done on behalf of his, despised people was not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life and mingle my blood with the blood of my children, let it be done. Uh, uh, so he kind of wrote the book on, on going out with a bang, which he did. And, uh, and during the, uh, um, his hanging, his execution on November 2nd, 1859, they said bells rang from 10 till noon all throughout New England. Again, there were gatherings. Uh, uh, in the Hartford Current uh, wrote that uh, promises were made of a fair and full trial, but the result has been far otherwise. The sympathies of the public always accords to those it believes to be victims of haste and rage. And eight, uh, a few days later, a Quaker lady, actually a few days before, a Quaker lady from uh, uh, Rhode Island wrote uh, of John Brown, how my dear friends love thee with all their hearts for their brave, for thy brave efforts on behalf of the oppressed poor. If the American people honor Washington for resisting bloodshed over an unjust tax, how much more ought thou to be honored for seeking to free the poor slaves? Uh, so, you know, again, lots of controversy and lots of uh, discussion. Uh, he's, uh, the, the casket is hardly uh, out the door when uh, the, Books and biographies and, and, and accounts of the whole history of it uh, come out in publication. And uh, again, this was the talk of America. I, I always thought this was amazing that uh, when I was doing my research on Sam Cole, uh, former President Franklin Pierce was a house guest at the Colts' house like three days after Harper's Ferry. And I just think it would have been fascinating to be a, a fly on the wall. Uh, 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 and hear the conversation about this incredible drama that was unfolding. I'm sure many of you know that uh, uh, Augustus Hazard 
uh, and what uh, Hazard Bill was actually one of Sam Colt's best friends, and they had lots of dealings. I'm all very excited. I'm sure, many of you know Alice Allen's going to be finally publishing Ed's fabulous book. I can't wait to see it, and it's great that she's hung in there and gotten this amazing job done. Uh, that's coming out shortly. So it's all this is all of that incredible period, and then he's he's gone, and and it immediately it, it, it inspires artists and poets and writers. Uh, the lithographers get back out and they create these kind of post-mortem pictures and statues. Uh, uh, the, the most popular battle song of the Union forces during the Civil War, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, was based on what was called the John Brown Song. And, and so this, uh, uh, I won't sing the lyrics or quote them, but we all know, know it. And uh, this sort of beatification started right away. Uh, this is a painting on the left by Thomas Noble showing John Brown's blessing, also a courier and I print, uh, a formal recognition of his ascension to heaven. I think the people that thought John Brown was a hero uh, thought he was an extraordinary hero, and they didn't, they didn't stop. Um, well, this is where I kind of, again, kind of got connected to the story. I was doing a project out in Norfolk, Connecticut, at the Battelle estate. And this is uh, uh, Robbins Battelle. Uh, and his grandfather was actually the, the Brown's minister. That's Ami Battelle. Excuse me, Ami Robbins on the right, who was the minister in Norfolk at the time that the Brown family lived there and was part of that whole Great Awakening uh, group that were. Uh, uh, what they called new light preachers that tended to be very uh, 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 anti-slavery. And this is the grandson, Robbins Patel. He is a contemporary of Elizabeth Colton, Augustus Hazard, and, and that generation. And he graduated from Yale in 1839 at the time that the Amistad thing uh, event was unfolding. So he became a very devout uh, 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 anti-slavery crusader. And, and it was partly because of him that I got into this. This is the art gallery that is attached to the Patel mansion, shown in the upper right there. And Patel uh, commissioned this painting, uh, uh, one of this painting on the lower right here that shows a uh, Confederate soldier being his wounds being dressed by dressed by uh, Northern uh, family uh, a a after the Battle of Gettysburg. And, and the idea here is kind of reconciliation between North and South. But some of the art. Uh, Robbins Mattel was a great art collector and patron of art, and he hired this guy, Thomas Hovenden, to do these paintings. And the most famous painting that he produced, and he commissioned this, is this, which is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It's called The Last Moments of John Brown. Again, Connecticut's Robbins Mattel commissioned this picture in 1882. The artist spent a year and a half researching it and working on it. It's enormous. It's, about, it's at least as big as this screen. And it's in New York City, but it was for many years in Norfolk, Connecticut. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it, it depicts the legend of the kiss, as it was called. The idea that as John Brown is descending the stairs to his execution from the jailhouse in West Virginia, that there's an African woman with a child, he leans over and kisses the child. So this is part of the, the folklore of John Brown, and it was uh, depicted there. Back in Osawatomie in the 1870s, they, uh, Erect one of the first monuments. I mean, it takes a while sometimes for history to be enshrined as history, for people to build monuments and write books. This was a monument, again, from the 1870s, in which they described Captain John Brown, who commanded the Battle of Osawatomie. He died and conquered American slavery on the scaffold of Charleston, Charlestown, Virginia. So, again, the idea is to kind of compare him to Jesus, really, the idea that. that, that uh, John Brown gave his life, sacrificed his life for the sins of America. And that was the idea of that monument. And these are various sculptors who have depicted John Brown. This is uh, the lower left, or the left here is at the Slater Museum in Norwich, Connecticut, uh, by a, a Connecticut sculptor. But different, uh, different, different interpretations of John Brown. And then back in Osawatomie, uh, this is the state park. That, Theodore Roosevelt was in town to dedicate back in 1910. He participated in the dedication. And more statues. And then I love if you ever get a chance to get up to the Adirondacks. It's right basically in Lake Forge, New York. It's a wonderful place to visit. And this is a state historic site. It's a house museum that 
run by the state of New York, but it's just a it's a it's, it's a it's a moving experience to go there. And it's a pretty humble farmhouse, but it's been a house museum. It's been a historic site for over a hundred years, and it's it's still remarkable. And that's where John Brown was buried. They shipped his body, actually, eventually his children, the ones that they had, and his father, actually, but all are buried there up in North Alba, New York, outside of Lake Placid. And uh, back in Harpers Ferry, uh, the uh, Baptists founded Storer College in 1869, and the firehouse, this is all important symbolism, it's a historically black college, Founded in Harpers Ferry and, and utilized the, 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 en, the uh, 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 engine house where John Brown was captured as, as uh, part of their uh, uh, campus. Uh, and it was actually there in 1910, 1906, the first public gathering of its kind uh, of African Americans beginning to politicize themselves. It was a precursor to the NAACP that was founded there. And it, it, W. E. B. Du Bois, who was a famous African American scholar and writer, uh, wrote in 1960. He actually was from um, 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 Great Barrington, Massachusetts. So a lot of these personalities kind of aren't too far from here. He wrote uh, 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 that this meeting in 1906 at the site was one of the greatest meetings that American Negroes ever held. And, and then, uh, interestingly, the 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 the, uh, the Cowles, uh, Robbins Patel, who we just introduced, he's an art collector. His daughter, uh, uh, em uh, uh, em em Emily, uh, and her husband, Carl Steckel, uh, lobbied to preserve the Brown birthplace as early as 1897, and eventually bought the birthplace in 1901 and opened it. There was a huge centennial of John Brown's birth event in Torrington in 1900. It was called John Brown Day, and they had activities at the homestead. There was patriotic speeches and songs. Uh, two sitting U.S. Senators participated in the speech, and by 1900, uh, they were able to describe John Brown as the as a combined as somebody who combined the best of a reformer and a, and a hero. Uh, John Brown, this is a U.S. Senator from Connecticut at the time, writing: John Brown is a martyr to the cause of human freedom. Letters from luminaries. Uh, and it was a big, big event in Torrington that year. And uh, over the years since, you can go on eBay if anybody likes to do that kind of thing, and you can find these little souvenir uh, cups and saucers from Torrington, and these are some from Osawatomie. So it just shows uh, postcards and pottery and various things that commemorated the life. Uh, the collections, uh, upper right, this was a collection that was formed in Hartford about this time, around 1900. Uh, that was a, a firearms collection, uh, and it, it had one of the Sharps rifles that Brown had used in Kansas, and one of the Harpers Ferry pipes shown on the right there. So, uh, and, and it, this is uh, amazing in terms of commemoration and how the story kind of lives and takes on a life of its own. This was is this huge mural in the Kansas State House. It's like 32 feet long. 16, 18 feet high, and it's titled The Tragic Prelude. It was uh, uh, produced by Kansas's first native superstar artist in 1938. And it was controversial, I mean, one might think, uh, that to have a, a mural of somebody that probably everybody south of Maryland regarded as a terrorist uh, uh, in your state house as a mural is, is uh, controversial. Uh, some thought that it showed the state in a negative light, <clears throat> not for the reason you think. Uh, the artist said, well, really, the, the red coloring on his hands, it's not real blood, it's just symbolic, uh, uh, that his acts caused bloodshed, and that the tornado in the background was a symbol of the abolitionist passion, not, as some believe, a discouraging reminder of Kansas's famously bad weather. <laughs> Gone with the, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, Wizard of Oz had just come out the year before, and, and, and so people in Kansas were like really freaking out because, you know, it's like, this is like the worst publicity Kansas could ever have is the Wizard of Oz. Well, I don't think it's worth too much. You go out there now, they have trails and people can visit the sites uh, uh, that are associated with that. This is that artist, and I should have brought these. I have a, a few of them at home. A, a, a good stocking stuff was a little early, but 
these t-shirts that I, I, I picked up from Kansas that show this famous view from the mural by that artist, there he is, John Curry. And this is amazing that when Kansas State University and the, and, and the University of Missouri play football with each other, it, it's, it's the, one of the most famous rivalries in the Big Ten football world. And apparently at halftime, the students from Kansas have this ritual that's been going on for 50 years where you know how people in baseball will do the wave and they will stand up? Well, well the students do this thing where they, they create a silhouette of John Brown and then make this terrible noise to scare the people from Missouri. So it's a really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of aggression in a sense because Kansas and Missouri, you know, that's what the whole John Brown battle was about, was duking it up between those two states. Well, back here in Connecticut during the 1930s, they commissioned murals. These were in the post office in Torrington and they show various scenes from John Brown's life apparently. Well, he didn't have any problem killing slave owners. He was as tender as an angel with animals. No. <laughs> and he had a way with animals. You could see him with his mother there in the lower right, uh, looking after the livestock. And then at some point, there was a story of him coming back uh, through town. And he was, at this point, an anti-slavery crusader. And he goes to a one-room schoolhouse. And it's hard to imagine this is really true. But apparently, the teacher yielded the floor so John Brown could recruit uh, eight, nine-year-olds to the cause of uh, anti-slavery. So he's asking them who in the room will pledge their life to free the slaves. You can see the boy in the background already get armed and go out and fight for the cause. So it's pretty interesting stuff and it's kind of amusing in some ways how history is remembered. Um, the, um, from an African-American perspective, it's interesting that blacks preserve this story. And in fact, the way Americans today, even in the South, by and large, interpret John Brown is pretty much the way W.E.B. Du Bois, who I mentioned was from Great Barrington, he was famous, he wrote the first biography, African American, of John Brown. And again, they, uh, uh, the interpretation has sort of come around. On the right is Frederick Douglass, a statue of him. Again, these were some of Brown's friends. I thought this was so moving, I went up to his church in Springfield. They not only have artifacts in the church's collection, breaks from John, the house John Brown lived in when he was in Springfield, the house is long gone, but in the 1890s when they built their new church on the upper right there, they commissioned a stained glass window in memory of John Brown, hero of Harper's Ferry. So you can see what this black congregation thought of him, and we're still thinking of him 40 and 50 years later. Pretty amazing. Uh, various artists, one of the great art, African American artists in the 20th century is this guy Horace Pippin. His works are in some of the major museums in the country, and it's, it's kind of an American primitive style, but he was a printmaker, and he did a series of prints uh, cap, uh, depicting the story of John Brown going to his hanging. It was interesting that his mother actually witnessed this. So this is the artist's uh, uh, renditions in the left and the upper right. And then in the lower right is a painting by a less famous artist uh, named Irving Nussbaum called The End of John Brown. That's him on a cart on his way to the gallows. And that's actually at the Torrington Historical Society. And then even more famous, Jacob Lawrence. And this whole series, I think there are 20 of these amazing prints that tell the story, the story of John Brown in pictures by Jacob Lawrence, who was an African-American artist in the 1940s. He did this, the John Brown series, and the whole series, Wadsworth Athenaeum is one of the few museums in the country that owns the series, and it's all on display, has been for a few months, and will be probably for the rest of this year. It's definitely worth, worth going to see. They're, they're really amazing. And these are, these are, again, some of these abstract, and they, they tell the story of uh, John Brown. There he's plotting the invasion of Harpers Ferry. That strange picture in the lower upper left there has to do with, I think, when he freed the slaves and went up to Canada, and I guess they must have encountered a bear or some snow or something, I don't know. But it, it's, it's great. And then this I thought was amazing. This was a movie, and it's called The Santa Fe Trail. And it came out in 1940, you think, well, what's The Santa Fe Trail got to do with John Brown? Well, that's all the story. I don't know why they call it The Santa Fe Trail, because it really, it's the John Brown story. It starred Raymond Massey, and Olivia de Havilland, who just the year before had been in Gone with the Wind, 
and Errol Flynn and Ronald Reagan. Those are the characters who are in this. And I got it on, on Netflix, and it, it's actually a pretty great movie. And they dramatize this whole story, and that's Raymond Massey's about to be hung, so you get the whole story, and uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing. And then in the 1960s with the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground, this story begins to reemerge once again. So these great stories sometimes have a life of their own, and they begin, they reflect, in a sense, what's going on in the world at any given moment. And then the, uh, during the Black Panther in the, the, the 1968 and all of the turmoil, uh, political turmoil of Vietnam in that era, era uh, the Weather Underground uh, called their newsletter the Osawatomi, and that was, of course, not an accident. So this is how that story lives. And, you know, again, I'm a great believer in what I call experiential learning. Uh, I think that our historical society in town here is so magnificent that every kid in this town, uh, they should be paying the historical society. The teachers and the school board should pay the historical society to do what you already do, which is to give these kids the magnificent grounding in local history that you can get in a historical society like this. We've got such a good one, and uh, I just think it's great. But there are lots of places that have interesting things. And Harper's Ferry, of course, is not only famous but beautiful. The Appalachian Trail runs right through it. And uh, this is my wife and our kids when they were little. They, they stopped going to historic sites with us when they were about 14. You can imagine. But up until that age, we could drag them anywhere. And so, so we had a grand old time. And they, they went to a lot of these sites. And Harper's Ferry is beautiful and interesting. They do a lot with it. It's not only the story of uh, John Brown, but also the story of the uh, uh, National Armory and Technology. Just like Springfield uh, Armory up in Springfield is an interesting national park site, so is Harper's Ferry. And then back in Osawatomie, these are just some of the great exhibits. I showed you that building where the cabin is, and that's a bed that John Brown slept in, and this is a desk where he wrote one of his manifestos. And I always get goosebumps, you know, you go to George Washington's Mount Vernon, you see a chair or something that he sat in, and I always think that kind of thing is pretty amazing. And they do such a great job in, 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 um, in, in Kansas, all those little spots in purple on that map on the left are, are places we visited when we were there, places where they have exhibits and, and, and landmarks and things you can see uh, that tell the story of uh, John Brown. And then I've already shown you, this is uh, more pictures from uh, North Alabama, New York, up in the uh, 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 Adirondacks. And then again, this Museum of Springfield History has this fabulous exhibit on uh, 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 Abraham Lincoln, John Brown and the Civil War, and they bring the story of the Civil War home to Springfield with these wonderful case studies and great artifacts that they've got. Um, and even I just thought this was amazing. At the 150th anniversary of John Brown, I actually attended this uh, at the Harper's Fair. Yale had a three-day conference. You, you wouldn't believe that you could find 30 scholars from around the country that all had something to say about John Brown, but it was Pretty, pretty fascinating, and the Virginia Historical Society uh, did an exhibit, so again, this story got a lot of play a couple of years ago. And then I attended this memorial service. This was, uh, again, in conjunction with Harper's Ferry, a ceremony uh, at the 150th anniversary of Harper's Ferry at the uh, birth uh, uh, place. Uh, uh, the, the house burned in the 1920s, unfortunately, uh, the, the John Brown <coughs> birthplace, but the cellar hole was still there, and the Torrington Historical Society operates this cellar hole in this site as a historic site, and, it, and it's definitely worth a detour, believe it or not, to see if there's, there's something to be said for it. It's really great. So, uh, and, and, uh, uh, so what's my point? I guess this is the last picture. This story matters because what it means to us is constantly evolving. It's a prism through which we can work out our understanding of America and American values through uh, and through which we can further the continuing errand into the wilderness that is America's journey of freedom. When I visit sites like Harper's Ferry, Gettysburg, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, uh, or more recently the Martin Luther King National Historic Site in Atlanta, and the Brown versus Board of Education National Historic Site in Topeka, Kansas, I not only learn, but am intensely proud to be involved in the storytelling profession of history and heritage tourism. I am in awe of how effectively the National Park Service at its best preserves and presents uh, 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 content that matters. 
And some of you know, you've probably read in the papers, we've been, I've been working on this for 20 years, but it's been picking up again. I, with any luck, I'll live long enough to see the National Park open a facility in Coltsville and to have a National Park in Hartford. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly been a long, long journey. But I think we'll get there. And that is, uh, he's just some of this Martin Luther King National Historic Site in the lower right. And then again, who would have ever guessed uh, uh, even 20 years ago, certainly 100 years ago, that we would live long enough to see a, an African-American president. So that's kind of what makes uh, America <coughs> special. History and knowledge uh, breed reverence. Reverence breeds strength. And in my view, the best national defense is to foster a sense of reverence and duty among Americans to embrace America's higher ideals with gratitude and with all our hearts, and to consider the possibility that furthering our path along the journey of freedom is how that shining light on the hill makes the world a better and safer place. Now this is a strange, I'm almost done, a strange picture. What to make of John Brown, terrorist or avenging angel? The jury came back with a verdict 150 years ago, but the jury remains out on the deeper meaning and probably always will. Consider the persistence of violence, vigilantes, and avengers in our popular culture and movies. And these are some pictures of Rambo and Dirty Harry, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and you think, gee, what's what's the, what's the point here? It's these bristling icons of freedom, if you dare call it that, even above the law, that seems so startling and dare I say refreshing to the many places in the world gripped by fear and repression. In other words, we don't have to actually worry about them. We do a little bit. By and large, this is not a reality. If you were living in uh, 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 Afghanistan or Iraq, this stuff isn't funny because this is the reality. This is what's on the streets every day. In America, we've got control to some degree over, uh, over those violent instincts and so can, in a sense, have, I hate to say, fun with it and amusement with it. But that's, that's sort of what we do. We also, uh, uh, invention, pathways of progress, the journey of freedom, walking the talk of our national mission. When you think of this, journey, it's beyond awe-inspiring, and reminds me of the words of one of my heroes, a, a Hartford woman named Emily Holcomb, who lived a hundred years ago, and she spoke of the value of history and straight state pride in, quote, establishing lofty standards of life, molding character, and inspiring noble conduct. Isn't that the foundation that freedom depends on? Finally, John Brown, bloodthirsty terrorist or heroic avenger, part of the promise of America is that we get to debate these things. Freedom versus justice, culture versus governance, rights versus responsibilities. It's all encapsulated in the national story of international consequence that passed right outside our doors here 150 years ago. So, hey, it's great to be with everybody. And uh, thanks so much for coming out. And uh, we'll turn the lights back on. Thank you.
the bell, I read that there were only 18 out of a, hundred, a few hundred blacks in office theory at that time. Yeah. There were slaves. And, and also, his organization, John Brown's organization, wasn't, it wasn't organized like the U.S. Army. Yeah. It wasn't disciplined. And one guy who was supposed to be carrying a wagon of those Collinsville pipes to the Army uh, didn't show up in time. See, if they had Twitter and Facebook, it would have been completely different. <laughs> they couldn't tweet that the revolution had begun. So. <laughs> But anyway, uh, speaking of which, if people are interested in this kind of stuff uh, and want to be on a little mailing list every once in a while, doing things not necessarily in any field that, that might interest you, whether that we did this fabulous Civil War treasure trove bus tour uh, last fall, some of you may have heard about, where we just had this incredible day. So sometimes I, if, if you want to put your name on the list, there's a little board over there. Otherwise, uh, there's refreshments. And again, thanks for coming out.